financial fraud, a young man from the mainland convicted of laundering about $1.7 billion through a Hong Kong bank over an eight-month period in 2010. But this conviction comes at a time when Hong Kong's been discussing changing its financial disclosure laws in a way that a lot of people say will make crimes like this actually easier to perpetrate. Let's join Roland Lin in Hong Kong for a bit more on this. Well, let's start with, with the case of, of the young man from China who's been convicted. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, it was, uh, he's actually a mainlander, uh, came into Hong Kong, opened up a bank account with a Hong Kong ID card because he's a resident here uh, at a branch of the Bank of China and then set up a company and then started funneling money from the mainland and mostly doing internet transactions. Uh, at one point, I think, one of his uh, online or online transactions or transactions on the, uh, over the counter was at some two million Hong Kong dollars. So. Obviously, an eight-month period, but in time, the authorities caught on to his scheme and nabbed him and froze his account, and then he was back on the docks uh, answering questions about money laundering. Okay, so at the same time, we've got this proposal uh, in Hong Kong that they should change uh, some of the corporate disclosure laws. Now, tell us what that is all about and, uh, and how this might impact the case that we're talking about. Well, there is that. There is a controversy right now uh, on plans to actually blank out the ID card numbers and addresses of company directors uh, from the public registry here for privacy purposes. Now, the shareholder they, uh, activist David Webb, uh, who's well known here in, in, in the Hong Kong circles, making sure that listed companies behave themselves. Now, he believes it's a step in the wrong direction. Webb says that any reduction in transparency increases the risk of money laundering. Even the, the, the Hong Kong Bank uh, Association of Banks have expressed concern. Over the possible move. Uh, according to one lawmaker I spoke to, you know, who's happy about it coming to pass, this, this new legislation? Well, mainland investors and big bosses in Hong Kong as well like it, especially because they get to keep their identities and their addresses uh, uh, back uh, out of things, and how much they own will also be hidden from the public. Uh, it's also likely uh, some some analysts are also saying that this is also likely to make it harder for uh, authorities to actually investigate uh, cases uh, of money laundering because they're not going to be able to identify or attach names to ID cards to transactions uh, that are perpetrated uh, in, in the financial system. Right. I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Roland Lim in Hong Kong. Thanks very much, Roland. We'll take a short break. Coming up on Business Central, is the World Economic Forum relevant? Critics say it's been reduced to a chinwag for the elite. We'll discuss that next. In the face of world financial crisis, Brunei has remained robust because of its oil-rich reserves. But the abundant so peace is now gearing towards diversifying its economic drivers. This is a country of high technology with a very young, well-educated workforce. The beauty of the mainland, we have our own resources. They're preserving the wildlife for Sarawak and Saba as well. Brunei, hidden opportunities. Tonight, 9.30 p.m. on Channel News Asia. This program is brought to you by the following sponsors. You can buy luxury. What you can't buy is respect. You've got to earn every bit of what you get and then do it again and again. What you create in life can let you live forever. You will be what you have done. Okay, everyone, we only got one shot with this. Stand by me. Studio so read, we'll live for five minutes. All right, stand by Andy, stand by opener.
after the minute breaking news. Join us for boundless career opportunities because of me called You're Our Star. Anti-competitive practices by businesses can result in artificially high prices, fewer choices, and lower quality products and services, which ultimately hurt both businesses and consumers. With competitive markets, businesses have to compete to offer better prices, quality, and product innovation. Brought to you by the Competition Commission of Singapore and Channel News Asia. Now, every year at this time, nearly 3,000 of the world's busiest business people and government leaders take four days off from their usual jobs of making money and making decisions, and they head to Switzerland to, well, to chat. It costs them a small fortune. It's estimated 40,000 US dollars is required to pay for flights, hotels, and all that fun. Being an actual member of the company of the WF can cost up to half a million dollars. So why do they do it? Some people believe it's a place where the rich and powerful gather to conspire and defraud the rest of us. Others believe the attendees are just defrauding their own companies by persuading them to fork out for a week of skiing and partying in the snow. We're going to discuss the value of Davos with Pierre Kalama, who's president and founder of the China Europa Forum. He joins me from Europe. And in Singapore with me, Bert Hoffman is chief economist for East Asia and Pacific at the World Bank. But uh, let's start with you. What are those people doing there? Why aren't you there? Well, uh, the World Bank is there, the World Bank Group is there, because uh, a lot of clients are actually there, and a lot of business is to be done. And yes, it's talking, but it's talking about very important issues, uh, inequality, infrastructure, poverty in the world, and the business community is definitely part of that. And my president is there, and he'll talk about uh, uh, in, in public and have a speech, but he'll also, have, of course, have lots of contact with his clients. He's the president of the Philippines, it's my previous stint, I was in the Philippines is there so it's also a place to do business and including the development business what, what does doing business mean in this context well it's i think it's it's getting agreement on the broad lines and getting agreement on the broad issues that, that are important for the world and are important for the specific countries that are also represented there and i want to support either for foreign direct investment or for investment in infrastructure but also for the broader issues of, of the world food security inequality of incomes very important issues for the World Bank, so that's why we're also there. Pierre, what do you think? Well, you know, the, the World Economic Forum 30 years ago started from a good intuition. The intuition that uh, world issues could not be dealt the conventional ways with uh, states building compromise, internal compromises, and then discussing together. There was a new set of of big players for globalization. And the idea which came from Raymond Barr at the time and Klaus Schwab was right to say, let us try and imagine a new way uh, for discussing on um, global issues. Unfortunately, uh, from year to year, it became a kind of plutocratic approach of, of world governance. And it became more and more ineffective and effective because each of these big players is in a silo thinking, you know, inside their own box. And they don't even realize that the states and the big companies now are part of the solution, but also mainly part of the problem. And then when you think in a silo thinking, you just cannot address the real issue. You cannot uh, overcome the schizophrenia, which is an evidence from each big state, big actor, you know, they deal on one side with how to launch growth in order to create social cohesion. On the other side, they discuss about protecting the planet. They cannot anymore connect that. Okay, well, and in fact, we, we now need a new stage of dialogue among the, 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 the world society. All right, we'll, 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 we'll talk about a different, a different kind of dialogue in a minute, but just, I just want you to see if, to see if you can actually nail down why you think it's not worth it. Um, everything, ever, the criticisms that you've made have been general observations, but it doesn't necessarily mean they shouldn't waste their time if they choose to. Well, I mean, it's just because it just cannot address the real issues. 
you, you could see that through what happened with Rio, Rio, Rio Plus 20, 20 years after Rio. It was a backstage, not a, a, a way forward. And the illusion that the states and the big companies can really address together the different issues of the world doesn't work anymore. Okay. So we have to explore alternative ways for the world community to be built, no. not only big players dealing with their own uh, short-sighted issues. All the, all, and, uh, all yeah. let, me stop, let me stop you there for a minute I mean, and, and come back to Bert. Uh, a lot of the journalists who are out there um, are providing what some people would consider to be infotainment. I mean, they're talking to the people in the snow and uh, pretending like it's all very important. But Pierre's got a point, hasn't he? Because uh, what isn't getting reported by the journalists out there is the number of people who are saying, look, when was the last time a significant success came out of Davos? Uh, and the last thing I've heard uh, was the interaction between Nelson Mandela and de Klerk was really the only thing you can point to that anyone has uh, come away from Davos saying that made a difference. So can you... Well, else. That, that's probably the wrong metric, and, and I think if you if you look at why people come to Davos, it's a part to do business and to, to network, but it's also in part to solve real issues. And countries come there for real issues. Take infrastructure. Infrastructure, uh, the shortfall of infrastructure finance is a trillion dollars a year. Uh, you can't solve that without the private sector. So one of the objectives that the World Bank has is to talk with businesses and see how can we work together with businesses to actually raise that kind of money to implement but it. Again, my question is, does that, does that get done? Because Pierre is saying that these people get together and you don't see that these, these discussions are better had in different forums. It's one place. It's not the only place. There's many more, many more places where you need to talk, including at the very grassroots where we are in, in the communities uh, to, talk about, to talk about rice dryers and very small infrastructure as well. But this is one part of the community that, is, that, that will raise oh, the money necessary. Put that to Pierre then. I mean, everything is incremental, Pierre. Every, every bit of the margin helps. Well, you can see that never Davos has brought in a new real perspective for the world. No perspective for overcoming schizophrenia. Oh. Uh, dealing with growth on one side and trying to stop the growth to protect the planet on the other side. These players just cannot imagine uh, alternatives. And they cannot imagine that they are really representing the, the, the common interests without the rest of the society. This is a mere illusion. When, when you look, I, I've been a, a secretary general of an international company. I know exactly how it works why they are short-sighted, how they cannot just imagine that the big company, which has been the key player for the 20th century, cannot be the pivotal player for the 21st century. Because the very way it's organized, their scope of time cannot bring them to deal with long-term issues of transforming production and consumption. Yeah, but they just can't, yeah, not because they're the, the, the common interests, and I wonder if that is actually what Davos is about. Because if you look at the, at the, at the uh, membership, and if you look at the people who are there, do they really represent the common interest? I mean, let, let me throw a couple of facts at you. Uh, the percentage of women in Davos is 17%. The percentage of Asian representatives is about 10%. Now, how can that really represent the common interests of the planet? Well, I mean, I don't think that they're actually meant to do that. But, but the, the, the regional representation is, you have a very good point. I mean, if you look at this region, very dynamic, only 10% Asian, as you say. Well, uh, the World Economic Forum also has a summer Davos, and they have it in Dalian. So that's one, one compromise if you want to have an India and Davos as well. Uh, but I don't believe that, that, that Davos is meant to be representing the whole world. And, and I think it's quite diverse, and there's lots of NGOs. There is the World Bank there. That is quite a diversity. Right. They're quite a diversity. <laughs> well, we, don't, we don't pay the 40,000, by the way. I don't think we're a, a corporate member. But, but we're there, and we're, we're talking. So there is a diversity of voices. If I look, and frankly, they're now beaming it on TV. I watched a little bit. There's quite a diversity of voices. And frankly, I find it interesting as a policy, as a policy analyst. And, and, and I appreciate you coming on here. I don't mean to put you in a position of defending Davos, because as you said, the World Bank is simply another attendee and not one of the, the people that organize it. But let me give the final word to Pierre. Pierre, I, um, a lot of people's uh, biggest fear out of all of this is that it's a, it's a conspiracy, that it's some kind of elite gathering that really rules the lives of people with no power. Is that what you think of it? No, it's not. You, you will not find issues for the world just bring the present major players to imagine alternatives which show that they are part of the problem even more than part of the solution. 
if I look at the way, for example, try and build a dialogue between societies in the, in the China-Europa Forum, you need to have all the stakeholders, small or big, and you have to make an effort to articulate the different issues. Uh, because otherwise, you know, you are always thinking, as some big companies do, that because they are big, they can address the, 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 the world issues. But they are struck in their own structure, in their own uh, short-sighting uh, vision, and it doesn't work. Uh, we will have to leave it, Pierre Kalama, founder of the China Europa Forum and Bert Hoffman of the World Bank here in Singapore with me. Gentlemen, thank you both very much indeed. My pleasure. <laughs>
young entrepreneurs like these Kashmiri youth know the power of e-commerce and how it can change the economic status of regions that got left behind, like militancy-affected Kashmir Valley. Smita Prakash, Channel News, Asia, New Delhi. As usual, I'll finish the th with the show with a few random thoughts. Now, I spent an hour this afternoon watching a documentary on the U.S. public channel, PBS. It was called The Untouchables, and it concerned this financial crisis we've been living through. The film takes a look back at those heady days before disaster struck, a time when banks and bankers were amassing fortunes beyond imagination by, among other things, giving mortgage loans to anybody who wanted one, whether they could afford it or not. The banks then packaged these mortgages into complex contracts, which they sold on in bundles marked safe investment. Well, as we now know, those investments were in fact less than solid. In 2010, when the whole system had collapsed, the former governor of the U.S. Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, told Congress, and I quote, a lot of that stuff was just plain fraud, unquote. Now, we all know the rest. The, glo the global recession was the worst in more than 60 years, and still, individuals and entire nations are suffering the effects. But the film concerned most of its time with a small group of people that didn't suffer. They are the untouchables, the powerful Wall Street brokers that conceived, green-lighted, and grew wealthy from the whole thing. Why, asked the reporter on the show, has not any of these men, not one, and they were all men, why none of them has been tried, let alone convicted, of doing anything wrong? Well, the man leading the investigation was Lanny Breuer, who coincidentally stepped down yesterday. He put his answer to that question very bluntly. He said, greed is not illegal. But for those of us old enough to remember the market crash of 1986 and the movie Wall Street, that comment will ring some bells. I recommend everyone visit www.pbs.org and watch The Untouchables. It's free. That's it from me for tonight. Hope to see you again at the same time tomorrow night. Bye-bye. Perspectives, we throw the spotlight on Myanmar, the turnaround country that went from pariah state to international darling almost overnight. At its helm, an unlikely champion of reform, General Turn President Ten Sen. Having made all the right noises and moves so far, hopes are running high for the new Myanmar. Can it live up to all the hype? I'm Lian Pick. Join me as we look at the future of Myanmar on the next Perspectives. Sunday, 8 p.m. on Channel News Asia. The CEO World Forum 2013, held in Ho Chi Minh City, brought together top business leaders to discuss the impact on enterprise and investor opportunities with the rise of mega cities in the region. The opportunities that people have 